This is the beginning of part five of the lectures on imaging of the cranial nerves. Next up is the glossopharyngeal nerve, the ninth cranial nerve. It has a variety of different functions, motor, visceral motor, sensory, visceral sensory, and taste. Uh, and I'm not sure that it's worth memorizing all of the different places it goes, but I think that it's important to know that it is contributing to the contractility of the pharynx and it uh, contributes to taste. Anatomically, the glossopharyngeal nerve arises from the lateral aspect of the med medulla. It gives off Jacobson's nerve that runs through the tympanic cavity and has some important pathologic implications. And after traversing the lateral medullary cistern, the glossopharyngeal nerve then exits through the jugular fossa, specifically the pars nervosa of the jugular fossa. On this oblique steady state free procession sequence, you can see the glossopharyngeal nerve traversing the lateral medullary cistern. It is just above the duplicated vagus nerve. Pathology that affects the glossopharyngeal nerve includes paragangliomas, specifically arising from Jacobson's nerve, glossopharyngeal neuralgia, which is often a component of Eagle syndrome, and pharyngeal hypocontractility, which is what happens when you have diminished contractility from the motor component, the visceral motor component of the glossopharyngeal nerve. Globus tympanicum tumors arise from Jacobson's nerve, which is a branch of the ninth cranial nerve. They arise in a very specific location on the cochlear promontory. This coronal CT shows us the cochlear promontory overlying the basal turn of the cochlea just beneath the internal auditory canal. And this round object here, that is a glomus tumor in its characteristic location. These are called glomus tympanicum tumors. This series of CT images shows us abnormal ossification of the styloid process. Here's the styloid process continuing down, continuing down, and here essentially meeting the hyoid bone. So the entire length of the styloid process has become ossified. You can either call this ossification of the stylohyoid ligament or elongation of the styloid process. Here is a multiplanar reformatted image along the course of the stylohyoid ligament showing ossification along its entire length. Here's the hyoid bone at the bottom. Now, ossification of the stylohyoid ligament in and of itself is not Eagle syndrome. It needs to be accompanied by characteristic pain syndrome that is presumed to arise from glossopharyngeal irritation. So the reproducible pain along with ossification of the stylohyoid ligament, that is Eagle syndrome. When you have chronic denervation due to loss of the glossopharyngeal nerve, there is decreased contractility and the pharynx becomes capacious. It's usually, usually unilateral and you can actually see this on uh, fluoroscopic images. You didn't think you'd be seeing any barium images on uh, in this lecture, but here it is. Look how capacious this piriform sinus is compared to its counterpart on the other side. This side has appropriate contractility squeezing the contrast out. Here the contrast is pooling in this capacious weak hypopharynx because of chronic glossopharyngeal denervation. Number 10, the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve arises from the lateral medulla and it has two distinct roots. Those two roots together cross the lateral medullary system, uh, cistern and then enter the jugular fossa. As the vagus nerve continues down in the neck, it runs posteriorly in the carotid sheath between the carotid artery and the jugular vein. Eventually, the vagus nerve will innervate a variety of different organs in the neck, chest, and abdomen. Here's that same picture. Now uh, the arrow points to the vagus nerve. Both of these lines are the vagus nerve. It has two rootlets that coalesce together in the jugular fossa. Uh, 
you can't always see the vagus nerve as it traverses through the neck. So you kind of got to know where it lives. It lives posterior in the carotid sheath between the carotid artery, either the internal carotid or the common carotid, and the internal jugular vein. So that's right where we want the vagus nerve to be. But you can't always see it. Vocal cord paralysis is one of the most important entities when we're discussing the vagus nerve. The recurrent laryngeal nerve is a branch of the vagus nerve. Its anatomy depends on which side of the neck you're on. On the left side, the vagus nerve extends down into the chest, gives off the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which then loops through the aortico pulmonary window and rises back up in the tracheoesophageal groove. On the right, the vagus nerve comes down to about the thoracic inlet, gives off the recurrent laryngeal nerve, and that loops underneath the subclavian artery and then back up in the tracheoesophageal groove. So when you are confronted with a patient with vocal cord paralysis, you need to check everywhere along the potential course of the vagus nerve from the skull base down to the mediastinum and then back up to the larynx in order to cover all the potential locations of a causative lesion. Here's an example of what the recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy looks like radiologically. You can see that there is medialization of the true vocal cord, right? But that's the secondary sign. What you're really looking for is displacement of the arytenoid cartilage. In vocal cord paralysis, it's actually the arytenoid cartilage that is medialized and the vocal cord itself is being dragged along with it. There are a variety of secondary signs of vocal cord paralysis, including asymmetry of the uh, hypopharynx with enlargement of the ipsilateral piriform sinus by displacement of the area epiglottic fold. But the key finding that you need to see in order to make this diagnosis is the medialization and usually some tilting of the arytenoid cartilage. Now let's run through some examples of lesions that can cause vocal cord paralysis. Starting up in the intracranial vault, uh, this sclerosis here is hyperostosis from a meningioma that you can see is extending into the posterior fossa and is extending down into the pars nervosa of the jugular bulb where it is impinging upon the 10th cranial nerve as it exits the skull base. So that's one location you can uh, hurt the vagus nerve and cause vocal cord paralysis. Here's another location. Here is an aggressive mass filling the aortical pulmonary window. This is another potential location where the left recurrent laryngeal nerve can be injured by a mass. This is why it's important when you're doing a CT of the neck for vocal cord paralysis that you extend the axial images down to the aortic pulmonary window below the arch of the aorta to ensure that you don't miss a lesion in this location causing left vocal cord paralysis. Here's a mass in the lower right neck, very aggressive appearance encasing the common carotid artery. And you know that the vagus nerve is running right here in between the carotid artery and the jugular vein. You also know that the recurrent laryngeal nerve is running here in the tracheoesophageal groove. So either of those two locations might be responsible for the vocal cord paralysis. Here's another example of the tracheoesophageal groove, this enhancing mass filling the left tracheoesophageal groove, and, right, esophagus, trachea, tracheoesophageal groove, um, right along the expected course of the recurrent laryngeal nerve. What about this lesion? Here's a huge goiter, a huge symmetric goiter, no malignant features, very benign appearance. It's obviously causing quite a bit of mass effect on the trachea. Will this lesion cause vocal cord paralysis? It turns out that despite the huge mass, these benign goiters don't cause vocal cord paralysis. And if you see vocal cord paralysis in this setting, you should look for another source. Maybe there's another lesion somewhere else along the vagus nerve or recurrent laryngeal nerve. Maybe there is dedifferentiation of an adenoma in, this, in an adenomatous goiter that is invading into the tracheoesophageal groove. It is usually not a benign goiter that causes vocal cord paralysis. What about tumors arising from the vagus nerve? 
Well, one thing to understand is the anatomy. When a tumor arises in the vagus nerve, the artery is displaced forward. If anything is splayed apart, it's the arterial structures and the venous structures being splayed away from one another, because remember that the vagus nerve is running between them. Splaying of the internal and external carotid arteries is not part of vagus nerve tumors. So when you get a paraganglioma arising from the vagus nerve, that is a glomus vagali tumor, you are looking to see that splaying of the uh, carotid artery from the jugular vein. Remember the paragangliomas are extremely vascular and you can often see flow voids on MRI. Uh, these tend to arise, these most commonly arise about two centimeters below the skull base where the no-dose ganglion of the vagus nerve exists. However, uh, these lesions can occur anywhere along the course of the vagus nerve. They're just most common at the no-dose ganglion. Another type of vagus nerve tumor is a nerve, sheath, nerve sheath tumor. Schwannomas are uh, far more common than neurofibromas, and they have the characteristic enhancement pattern that we've seen elsewhere along the cranial nerves. This is what a vagal paraganglioma looks like. Uh, very important to recognize that the uh, internal carotid artery has been splayed away from the internal carotid vein by this tumor, right? It arose behind and between them and pushed them apart from each other. Large flow voids, hugely vascular tumor, characteristic of a vagal paraganglioma. And here we are right below the skull base. Um, we're, we're looking at the uh, at C1 here. So um, uh, this is the most common location for this lesion. Here's a very similar looking lesion in some ways. This is a, uh, a lesion that is once again splaying the internal carotid artery away from the internal jugular vein. Here we have a heterogeneous patchy enhancement with areas of non-enhancement and areas of uh, extensive enhancement in a geographic distribution. That's pretty characteristic of a schwannoma. It's really the location that allows us to identify this as a vagal tumor, and then we can look at the characteristics of the tumor to decide whether it's more likely to be a schwannoma or a paraganglioma. This ends part five of the lecture on imaging of the cranial nerves. One more to go.